Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register. Technical difficulties, my fault for starting three minutes late. I'm sorry about that. Tyler Tashman, my colleague at the Des Moines Register. Fun to be with you today at the Iowa football facility. Tyler, lots of stuff to unpack. Uh, I think we'll probably start with the offensive coordinator discussion, but we got four players. So Tory Taylor, Cooper DeGene, Sebastian Castro, Jay Higgins, defensive coordinator Phil Parker, and head coach Kirk Ferentz. Uh, out of all that, uh, what stood out to you today? Well, starting with the players, the three guys that have big decisions ahead of them, Jay Higgins, Sebastian Castro, Cooper DeGene, all currently um, haven't decided yet about whether they're going to return to Iowa next season or pursue a professional career. Um, they kind of, you know, gave a little bit of insight into, into their thought process and um, the, the different factors that they're weighing. And I thought Jay Higgins uh, had a very mature approach to it of basically saying like he didn't want to, I'm paraphrasing, but he didn't want to make like an emotional decision. He wanted, he didn't want to uh, make one just because of, he felt one, you know, one way one day and one the other, but he, you know, he wanted to make sure that he was taking into account um, every, all of the different circumstances and questions and, and potential, you know, uh, roadblocks that could come up. So I thought that was a mature approach to it. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how much you want to hit on offensive coordinator, but Kirk Farron said he's, he's talked with three candidates, um, you know, likely going to be talking with another one didn't, you know, disclose really who those were, but, you know, we can probably draw, you know, draw some, connect the dots a little bit, but, um, and also does not expect the hire to be done before the bowl game. So as far as the timeline goes, that was kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a notable detail. Yeah. Before we get to the names, why don't we start with kind of the, what Kirk Ferentz is looking for, what he said he is kind of, uh, focusing on in this search. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can read my article at hawkcenter.com right now while we talk. Uh, if you want to get a couple names, uh, you, nothing is going to be a huge surprise there. But, uh, you know, I think what it was clear to me, Tyler, that he wanted to make the point that complementary football is still the number one most important thing. And he needs an offensive coordinator who understands that. Uh, you know, basically the, uh, the quote was, you know, whoever it is needs to be good with that. So like the idea that, uh, hey, Kirk Ferentz is going to turn over the keys to do for the offensive coordinator to do whatever he wants to do, uh, that is not going to be the case. And I know that frustrates some people. You know, I would like to, you know, there's part of me that would like to see something like that to see how it would go, you know, almost like, uh, a little bit of an experiment, but I think you also saw maybe up in Wisconsin, even just a little bit this year, like when, you know, I'm sure they'll iron things out up there, but like when you change your offense, it does impact the way your whole team plays as a defense in Wisconsin, you know, didn't play as well as Iowa did this year, uh, even though Iowa had the crappiest offense in college football. So I feel like Kirk did a really good job at, sharing his message about why that's important. So I encourage everyone to check out that 17 minute video and uh, yeah, he's not budging, man. So, and he's not leaving either. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, that quote that comes up, check the stats, my team's winning. That's, that was pretty fitting to it, but that was one of my, I guess, kind of questions going into this is, how much jurisdiction is Kirk Ferentz going to give to whoever the next offensive coordinator is to put their own spin on, you know, the scheme or offense. And I don't want to say like Kirk totally shut the door to everything today, but he was pretty clear of basically saying complimentary football is important. Uh, taking care of the ball is important. Um, and, and he also said basically that the most important, important stat for him when looking for a coach is wins per game not necessarily how much passing yards someone is putting up how many rushing yards whatever as you know offensive coordinator head coach or what it'd be but that was a pretty for as much as he could say it seemed like a pretty strong indication that it's going to be similar to what it had like they're not going to change their playing style um drastically like it's going to look pretty similar now I'm interested to see like 
how much of a spin does he allow the, you know, whoever's the offensive coordinator, like how much of, you know, how many, how many more chances, you know, it, there's not going to be drastic changes, it seems, but is there going to be minor changes? You know, what, how, how much is allowed to be changed? So, uh, but yeah, he was, I mean, the, the message I got from it today was pretty much they're going to continue to play that the way that they've played because it's been successful and, he's going to look for that in, you know, an offensive coordinator coming in is has to know that that's the way that I was going to play. Yeah. So one of the answers he gave, which I did not include in my column, I kind of wish I would have, but it was like hard to pick what to keep and what to, what to throw. Uh, I'll talk about here because he basically made the analogy of hiring Norm Parker back in 1999. We know he loves to go back to the 90s, the 80s, uh, the 2000s. So uh, not a surprising reference there. But uh, he basically said it was the best hire he ever made was hiring Norm Parker. And he said in in a nutshell that he didn't care if Norm Parker ran a 3-4 or a 4-3. He said you're – he goes to play defense. You've got to play blocks, no matter what front you're in. You've got to run the run to the football in a smart way. You've got to be able to tackle. You can't give up big plays. Those kinds of things are non-negotiable. That's just how you've got to do it if you're going to play defense. But it was totally up to him to design the ABCs, all that stuff. I feel the same way about this hire. So he went on to talk about the importance of ball security and uh, complimentary football. That's Those are basically the only two things I think he really cares about on offense is that you don't do stupid things to throw the game away. And as has always been the case, to protect the defense. The defense is the basis of this team. That's what got Iowa to 10 wins this year. That's what got Iowa to 61 year wins over the Brian Ferentz era as offensive coordinator. Uh, so uh, I don't mind that at all so i do think there is what i heard in that answer tyler was some leeway in those abcs i think that's where whenever we get the hire uh to write about that it will be about dissecting those abcs how will coach x go about playing comp complimentary football uh, maintaining ball control but also hopefully doing things a little bit more productively as an offense but the, the I guess the not problem I see with it, but the kind of two things that might be contradicting each other a little bit is like you only have so much leeway to do things offensively if there's an emphasis on taking care of the ball, right? Like you you can do all the ABCs you want, but there's there's only so many weird or you know creative or explosive things that you can do if the emphasis is, Hey, we're going to make sure that we take care of the ball. So, um, you know, I, that's where I'm curious to see if, of how much leeway, you know, the, the next offensive coordinator is given it, you know, it also kind of plays into the question of like, how does Iowa make this a more appealing landing spot for offensive playmakers? Because with the exception of uh, like tight ends, like it, I mean, it, I was not a place that wide receivers are cl are clamoring to, you know, land at. Same thing with quarterbacks. Like, it, it what can you do with the scheme with, you know, just the way things are called to make Iowa a place that playmakers want to go? And I think that's part of the reason that uh, Cade McNamara coming to Iowa was so – it felt so seismic because it's just – it's just not the most appealing landing spot for a guy like him, but he, you know, the, the, the culture is there, the, the, it, it's, it's a place that has a lot of benefits to it, but um, I think you need to enhance it a little bit more with just the way you're playing offensively or how you're using, you know, specific uh, position groups to make it an appealing place for guys in the portal and guys coming out of high school. No, you make a good point there about, uh, you know, you can't completely restrict the offensive coordinator, but it's it'll be it'll be interesting to see, yeah, how how what the shackle level looks like, I guess. But the thing is, like, they did not protect the ball very well this year, so um, you know that was not uh, something Iowa was good at. So I think that uh, that's what makes winning ten games all the more uh, crazy. 
uh, for the Hawkeyes this year. But uh, uh, where was I going to go with this? Uh, I guess let's move into you know a couple of the names. Uh, you know, Paul Christ and Joe Philbin are, are among the four finalists. Um, he didn't say that, but that's accurate to say. Um, don't have the names of the other two uh, that he's discussing. And I do believe that's an accurate number four. So, uh, but I think of all those guys, um, you know, he has, he clearly has respect for both Paul Christ and Joe Philbin. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that, <laughs> that Joe Philbin is not a done deal. Uh, that is, a, uh, is not accurate. Um, if I know some people kind of in with that a little bit last week, but uh, not, not true. It uh, doesn't mean he won't end up being the OC, but that's not that's not uh, not the current situation. Um, but Paul Christ is the I think the most intriguing one of those two names to me, just because of the uh, knowledge of what it takes in the current Big Ten landscape, because of his success he had, uh, because of how good he is in the run game, kind of an area that Iowa has not been great at the last several years, and something Wisconsin was really good at. Certainly, Jonathan Taylor helps, but uh, he he knows how to to manipulate numbers and, and run the football. So uh, I like that uh, fit. And also, Paul Christ is not a look at me type of guy. Um, not a um, you know not a flashy guy. Nobody you know not going to be a great quote. Unfortunately, uh, if he is the guy <laughs> for us, I, we like good quotes. He would probably be among the like the. He might kind of be like Phil Parker, really, which I think a lot of people would take in terms of production if that were the case. But, you know, he's not going to say much. He just wants to coach, basically. So I, I think that that would make a lot of sense, but I know the search is not over yet. And I feel like the the timing of getting a new OC, like it comes at a, what is already a crossroads already for Iowa because it's the, the conference obviously starting next season is changing. Oregon, Washington, UCLA, USC entering the Big Ten. And regardless of if there was an offensive coordinator change, the question for me with this new conference is, like, can Iowa continue to survive? Like, they've somehow managed, you know, NIL, transfer portal, all of the, all of the way that the college landscape has changed. Iowa has, like, managed to still find success. Kirk Ferentz is, like, continuing to defy – age and, and you know he's still managing to get things done now you have these four uh uh new schools coming in can Iowa continue to somehow some way get by you know continue its brand of football especially with like Washington and Oregon who are just like high flying offenses um and then you throw the OC into it and you know new offensive coordinator and that just throws like another another kind of circumstance into well how does Iowa adapt to this changing world you know changing college football world to the changing conference you know is it going to be left behind because his offense is just going to be too poor like at, at at what point can Iowa's defense just not shoulder the load anymore and continue to lift it up so you know it, it feels like because of um, especially some of the offenses coming into the conference like that's going to really be tested does Iowa are they going to have enough offensive firepower to uh, you know, stay afloat in, in, in this new kind of landscape. Yeah. And I feel like Ferentz kind of addressed that a little bit today with some of his comments. He kind of took a shot, uh, especially at USC. There's no question about that. Um, you know, USC went seven and five this year with Caleb Williams as its quarterback. So I think that was kind of his way of saying like, yeah, you know, committing to defense is the way to win football games. And uh, I get, the last two and a half years have been just abysmal offensively. Like it's, it's not acceptable. It's not good. Uh, they have to get better. They had to make a change. Beth Getz and Barbara Wilson deserve, you know, I feel like credit for enforcing that change that needed to be made. It was just time to get a new offensive coordinator. And I don't know if, if uh, this 25 points per game thing hadn't been installed, I don't think a change would have been made even with this year's stats. It's just uh, so 
I think turning the page is, is a productive thing for the program. And I was just thinking back to the Big Ten championship game here, Tyler. Like, the defense played good. If they just could have moved the football at any level and protected the football, I mean, let's be honest, it was minus three. Like, Kirk Ferentz is correct. They could have won that game if they just had – but they do have to have some, some offense at some point. And, uh, my, you know, my sense is that they're they're not losing guys in the portal. Now, maybe we'll, we'll all be shocked, you know, after the bowl game, whatever. Maybe the day after the bowl game, a bunch of guys go in. That could happen, maybe. But right now, we're not seeing like a mass exodus. You're not seeing a panic. I think Ference has has done a good job of – whatever he's communicating to his current offensive players, and there are good offensive players on this team uh, that they would like to keep, especially one of the, you know, at least one tight end that would like to go to the NFL at some point. Uh, I think they've done a pretty good job kind of keeping everyone, you know, happy. And I mean, it's, we're not seeing like a lot of chaos here, despite not having an offensive coordinator yet. And I'm, it's possible that the reason there hasn't been chaos is because people are just waiting to see, you know. What, yeah, you know, for so sure. That, yeah. Um, but I think he's going to have an idea by January 2nd. I do. Like, yeah. He's not going to have it finalized, but I think he's going to have a pretty good idea of like the direction and, you know, who is realistically mm. going to take the job. Like, yeah. you know, not necessarily all four of these names would take the job, but. Uh, I think he'll have a better idea by January 2nd and probably can communicate that to, you know, Caleb Johnson, every ever the running back in the room, all the receivers that are, that may stay. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and I thought it was interesting about him bringing up USC because there, that, that also brings, you know, up the idea of just the fact that whoever is taking over as offensive coordinator is going to have to be battling the perception they're going to have to try to change the perception of Iowa's offense because it is basically like everything Iowa's offense does is kind of it's been it's been like a national joke you know like even if even if they have a good day it's like oh look at look at Iowa's offense go like they're finally right yeah point. so it's like it it's a lose lose situ it's been a lose lose situation because wow. they don't score points and they get you know just piled on they do score points and it's they get piled on as well. How, you know, how low can the over under go? And it's just like, but so whoever takes over as OC, like that's going to have to be like, they're going to have to change the perception of, of how I was offense uh, is viewed and that. And that starts with results, but um, that's not easy. Cause it's, I look at it almost as like the way Louisville basketball is right now. Like it's just, it's just so close to, or at rock bottom that everything around it is just, it's there's a certain toxic nature about it. So, um, but, but with all that being said, with the fact that they're going to have to change the perception of it, they're going to, it's, it's obviously a unit that has been struggling across multiple seasons and needs significant strides forward. I also think that I was offensive coordinator job is like, there is appeal to it. You get to work with Kirk Ferentz, um, who's just really respected by people that work with him, by people in the college football world. Um, you're at a big 10 school with an extremely passionate fan base um, that, you know, that cares about football. They were showing up at Kinnick stadium, even when the offense was terrible. Imagine what would happen if the offense was average or below average. Um, and, and I think in, with the, and with, you know, the NIL resources that Iowa has, they, they have resources, they have money and um, you know, I guess just, effort and you know time dedicated to football so at you know while this is a major project you know I, I feel like there definitely is some kind of appeal that's overlooked about this job because um you know you don't you don't need to turn things around and make it an elite offense you make it an average offense and it in Iowa becomes a national championship caliber team because you also have the benefit of Phil Parker managing the other side of the ball so like you know imagine telling an OC like you have Phil Phil Parker managing the defense like that's that's a pretty good deal so yeah just some stuff to keep in mind kind of you know as this continues to go on yeah it's gonna be the I mean 
after the hires made, which will be early January, probably. I mean, Kirk Ferentz basically saying they'll kind of nail it down after the bowl game, uh, sometime after the bowl game. I believe, uh, I want to say, well, this is all unprecedented territory. So I, I think it'll be pretty quickly after the bowl game. Be my guess. Um, you know, once they can finalize things, it's got to be posted for two weeks. They just posted it last week. So uh, they're not, you know, it's going to be after the bowl game. Just uh, deal with that. But that's not that far away. I mean, it's like two weeks away. And one of them's like Christmas week. The other week's a game week. So it's not like uh, forever here. And, uh, you know, we talked to Phil Parker today. And uh, he, you know, I did ask him, like, have you gotten calls, you know? <laughs> I go, or has your agent gotten a call? He goes, agent? He's like, I don't have an agent. <laughs> that's just classic classic phil parker um and i believe him i don't know if he has an agent he must not um and he but he's heck happy here he like doesn't like he just wants to coach and like what a like that is like so uh kirk ference is so lucky to have him and and you know he's done a good job keeping him obviously he pays him well but but yeah it's it's going to be the number one storyline whatever it is for these next eight months it's going to be like how will Let's say it's Paul Christ. How will Paul Christ, you know, whatever the, with this offense, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's just and, – and there's at least going to be some hope and some anticipation. And uh, I feel like you're right. The, the narrative, you know, it's just the whole nepotism thing. It just was not a good narrative for this program and for attracting people. And if you bring in – a, a big name like a Paul Chris, for example, I mean, I think you're going to be able to retain and attract guys. Maybe not right away, but I think eventually that that will sell. I do. And I mean, Phil was Phil was pretty outspoken just about the fact that he just doesn't seem pleased with the way college football is becoming with like people playing for themselves rather than the team. And like, but I think that's reflected in him staying here for so long is like he he doesn't seem swayed by external factors by like what people are supposed to do in their careers and like what you know what's looked at as the norm um you know for for coaches to take the next step in their career and all that type of stuff but also credit to Seth Wallace you know for you know the job that he's done with Iowa's linebackers and um uh yeah I mean as far as the offensive coordinator, um, you know, it. how how quickly do you want to see results? I'm sure fans are want to see it immediately, but I think a testament to that it might take time is like Phil Longo coming into Wisconsin last season. And, he, I mean, he had great offenses at uh, North Carolina, Coach Drake May, Sam Howell, and uh, Wisconsin. I mean, I don't know the the – total numbers of Wisconsin's offense, but they really struggled against Iowa. So it's like, it's not like it's going to be a snap of the finger, whoever the next offensive coordinator is and suddenly everything gets better. It's probably going to take some time, which I'm sure fans don't necessarily want to hear, but like that, you know, that's probably the reality of it is that it's going to, it's going to be a transition period and, you know, it might not happen immediately. Yeah. They still need players. And, uh, you know, at this point, I think your best bet at, having players as Cade McNamara stays healthy, Luke Lachey comes back, uh, Caleb Johnson stays, Caleb Brown stays, all that, Seth Anderson stays. I mean, I think – and then you hope that some of these guys, the red shirts, maybe like a Jarrett Bowie, you know, guys like that are going to hit uh, this coming year. You know, Addison Ostrenga had a nice developmental year. You got to – you know, got to get healthier on the offensive line, hope some of those younger guys develop. But so it's not going to be, you're right. It's not going to be a quick fix because it does not seem like Iowa is positioned, positioned to hit the portal hard during the stretch. They don't have openings. We've kind of been over that. Um, and the, the their main goal is to retain the guys they have and then build on that. Um, and if they can keep some of these defensive guys like Sebastian Castro, Jay Higgins, Maybe Cooper DeGene, although I really don't think that's going to happen. Um, you know, that would be that would be huge as well. So, um, yeah, good stuff. But one of the uh, one of our questioners had the the question disappeared. There it is. Uh, Scott says, uh, "How common is it for a Power Five D one program to actually put out a want ad for a prestigious position as a lead coordinator?" 
as it appears, no one was pounding down the door for the job. So uh, to answer that question, Iowa does have to post that for two weeks before it can make a hire. Um, that's just the, the protocol for the university. So uh, they do. I don't know how if that's a must for every other program. I don't know that. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't look at that as like I was desperate to find somebody to apply for the job. Uh, I do know that there is a lot of interest and uh, I think Kirk Ferentz has zeroed in on some of that interest. Uh, what was it? He said, I got to find that quote. Um, he said, based on what I know, as I stand here right now, I feel total confidence that we'll have a really good person here. There's some strong interest from people that would make a lot of sense that really would fit what we need. So take, take it for what it's worth. Uh, and he's got a list, you know, if, if some of those guys don't want the job, you can go further down the list. Um, we'll see. I, I think people are going to be happy with this hire when it happens. I yeah, do. But to the question that was asked, it was, that was kind of getting like slammed on social media of like, Oh, look at, you know, Iowa putting up there. But, but that also, I feel like just goes to the point I was talking about of like, everything Iowa's offense does is just like poke fun and like that poke fun at. And that's kind exactly of, like, yeah. it's, you know, it's something like they have to literally, they have to do it. And it's, it gets, you know, it becomes a joke or whatever. But that's part of the, part of the, the challenge with whoever, you know, takes over at offensive coordinator is just, you know, the, changing, I guess the stigma or whatever it is that, that is surrounding Iowa's offense. Yeah. And that's part of the job too. It's uh and I think so to Scott's point, the, the the commenter there, you know, there is, you know, there is a little bit of risk for someone to take this job. Right. I mean, because you can't uh, you can't argue that the the, the numbers probably are not going to look great for you just because of the style that Kirk Ferentz wants you to play. So uh, that will maybe inhibit candidates. But from what I've heard, I think I think they're in good shape. I do. Uh, I think uh, I think just be patient. I feel like it's going to come out uh, in a positive way for the program. Could be wrong. I mean, I think Paul Chris would be a good hire. If you don't, if you guys don't think that's a good hire, um, you know, totally respect that opinion. But um, I think that's probably like the floor of of what this what the hire will be at coordinator. I guess that's where I would leave that. Uh, other stuff that came up today: Luke Lachey, unfortunately, not going to play in the bowl game. Uh, Kirk Ferentz basically said he's close, but it just wouldn't make sense to push through. Um, so I guess uh, didn't quite make it. Didn't quite make it. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, Cooper DeGene, you know, hobbled out to interviews today. Uh, he was he was really good. I felt like uh, the, the thing that stood out to me the most was just I can't remember which game it was. Rutgers, maybe? No. He, he played in – I don't remember which one he played in. It was Illinois. Illinois. Was Illinois. Illinois. He was talking about standing for the anthem, and he was mm -hmm. starting to get, like, tearful and emotional because he wasn't on the field. And, um, yeah, that's – it really, really stinks for Cooper. Uh, that's the one you just wanted to see. Oh, and Phil Parker compared him to, to Niall Kinnick. Did you, were you there for that part? Yeah, that was pretty yeah, crazy. Yeah, I was there for that. Yeah. yeah. He's like he, – he's the 2023 version of Niall Kinnick, and I really can't – uh, as somebody who lives in Adel, uh, I'm not gonna dispute that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say Cooper DeGene is that now Kinnick's better than Cooper DeGene. I can't, but I can't not say that either. I didn't see him play. DeGene Stadium is that coming? Kinnick DeGene Stadium. <laughs> Maybe if he stays another year, right? Yeah, that would be the that yeah. would be the ploy. Uh, what else? You talked to Castro for, and Higgins for a lot longer. I talked to Taylor more. I'm working on something on him. Uh, anything else stand out from, from those guys today? Um, Jay was just saying there has been like internal discussions between guys of, you know, what, what they're thinking, I guess. So there, like there has been communication of potentially multiple guys staying. Um, and I mean, it was, it was, you know, similar to the discussions that you would expect of basically like Casho saying how he's always wanted to play in the NFL, but you know, he could also come back and develop more. So um, there's that piece to it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like if out of those three, if, if Iowa can get two, at least two of them back, you know, that would be that would be a win. And and the other thing is too is like it's important to understand that that will make the outlook of Iowa's defense like pretty rock solid coming in next season. But like 
there's also going to be a lot of questions still on the offensive side of the ball. So like that, like, you know, Jay and Sebastian coming back, isn't suddenly going to solve Iowa's problems. Like they're still, they still have a lot to figure out offensively, but it, what it, what it might do is that give Iowa a little bit more breathing room to figure out what it's going to do on offense and, and work through growing pains because we've seen this season that because of the defense was so good and or how bad Iowa's offense was like, they, they still managed to win games. So with, with the new OC coming in and like, we've been talking about like how there could be growing pains, having that elite defense again, will give them some room to make mistakes and to hope, you know, the hope would be that they get better over the course of the season, which just wasn't really the case this year because of injuries and circumstances. But um, yeah, it, it would kind of solidify the defense as, as having high expectations next season. So, we, yeah, we got to see the guys kind of walking off the practice field today as we went to interview Phil Parker and Kirk Ferentz. And uh, I noticed Bo Stevens was practicing, so that's a good sign for the O-line. Uh, Deontay Craig was not practicing. So, I mean, Dunker I know he, was. Dunker was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good eye on that. Jennings Dunker was. So, uh, that's those are all good signs. I think, uh, I think they're going to be a lot healthier up front for the bowl game. Uh, so, that's – you know that's a positive. They want to they want to become the fifth Hawkeye team in history to win eleven games, and that's a pretty pretty notable goal. Something we'll be talking about, I'm sure, next week uh, as we lead up to the Iowa versus Tennessee game. One more item that I guess we haven't mentioned yet, right? Is Brian Ferentz may not coach in the bowl game. That is something that is still up in the air, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. I I didn't I guess I didn't see that coming. Maybe I should have. Uh, Kirk Ferentz was asked about that and basically said, you know, Brian's got to look out for himself. So if he gets a job tomorrow, you know, he's probably not going to be coaching in the game. But Iowa does leave for Orlando like next Monday or Tuesday. So <laughs> he would have to get a job pretty soon. I don't think he's going to like leave from Orlando. Like, yeah. if you got, it. but I'm but anyway, kind of interesting. Might, yeah, who might call the plays if he does? It? You know, John Budmeyer. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the protocols are. Like, if Bud Meyer could come off the bench, so to speak, if you don't have that, maybe he could be elevated to interim offensive coordinator for a week, potentially. I, I don't really know how that works exactly. And uh, I tried to jump in for a follow up on that, and uh, I got shouted out. So uh, it was hard to get. Uh, questions in today. I got one in to Kirk and one into Phil. Maybe I might have got two into Phil actually. Oh, it was the agent one. It was like all follow ups though. So I was like, <laughs> um, and he said he didn't get any tip that he was going to win the Broyles. So I thought that was interesting. Usually he said he didn't even think he was going to go out there. <laughs> yeah, like, I, know. Like, yeah. I didn't even want to bother going out there because they had a <laughs> bunch of other good candidates. <laughs> I know that was pretty funny. Like he didn't even want to go to the Broyles ceremony. <laughs> Total fill. Uh, very funny. Uh, anything else, but Tyler, before we wrap up? Um, just another little like nugget from what we saw. Jacob Bostic was he was getting an extra work on the like I guess Jugs machine or whatever mm -hmm. you know whatever brand it was. I know you like him. You thought he was gonna mm -hmm. flash him this season, but anyways, he was getting an extra work after practice. So yeah, uh, line is we. I don't know. We, it was just uh, it was kind of good to get back into the football rhythm a little bit today, and uh, we do have uh, National Signing Day on Wednesday, so we'll get Tyler Barnes, and I think a little bit of Kirk on Wednesday about the signing day class. But usually he gives like an opening statement and then turns it over to Tyler. So that's probably what we get, unless there's some, you know, update about Brian or something like that. But uh, anyway, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks, Tyler. Uh, not much hoops this week. What's the hoops schedule this week? I Iowa plays Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday against UMBC at Carver Hawkeye. So. Okay. And the women play Thursday at home. So that's your basketball update for the week. <laughs> and Keegan Murray is good. Yeah, he is good. He's very <laughs> good. <laughs> Iowa could use him right now. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, no Hawk Central radio show this week. So, uh, sink into this one for your uh, podcast unless we have an emergency pod we'll jump in on that but uh, enjoy your holiday week coming up and uh, for Tyler Tashman this is Chad Lice to go saying so long and talk to you soon